Let's pray together once again. O oh, Heavenly Father, how indeed we thank you for those words. Stayed upon Jehovah. Hearts are fully blessed, finding, as he promised, perfect peace and rest. Father, peace is something that our hearts long for. For some, Father, it is a sense of inner peace, when in their hearts there is but turmoil. For others, family, perhaps, where there is discord, we pray for peace. Perhaps, Father, it is for our world, where we long to see peace. Our prayer would be that our hearts would be stayed firmly upon you, our Father, our Heavenly Father. And not only our hearts stayed upon you, but that we might be reminded of the words that the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write that are recorded for us in Philippians 4. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. Father, how we pray that in our hearts as we long and we search for peace, we might know that the Lord is near. And his very nearness, nay, his very presence might remind us that we need not be anxious, for our God is with us. Heavenly Father, yes, we pray for our world. We pray for our friends, our family, our loved ones. But how we pray, Lord, that they would know true peace, that they might find through the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice that they have peace with God. That they might, Father, know the peace of God and receive peace from God. This is our prayer, Father, even as now we would turn to your word that we would find in you all that we need through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Read with me now, if you would, from John chapter 7, beginning at the first verse. John chapter 7 and verse 1. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand, so his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, Show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. This morning we launch into the seventh chapter of John's Gospel. We left chapter six at something of a watershed. But the very fact that chapter seven begins with the words, after this, causes us to, to simply recap on how chapter 6 ended. It ended 
with many of those who had followed Jesus no longer with him. Because the things he said were hard. Not simply hard to understand, but hard to actually take on board. And then, of course, we come to that point in the closing verses where he asks his disciples, do, do they want to go as well? And, and Simon, Simon Peter responds, where else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. What a tremendous affirmation and proclamation of confession of who Christ is. But then as we noticed last Lord's Day, those final verses that cause us to reflect on the awfulness of Judas's betrayal. But we move on. We move on into chapter 7. We're told that Jesus was going about in Galilee. He wasn't going to Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. So already the religious leaders have formed in their own minds the very clear opinion and decision that Jesus of Nazareth needs to be done away with. The people are going after him. The people are following him. He is speaking with an authority that they themselves do not have. And what he is saying is being backed up by the mighty signs that he is performing. Now, the Feast of Booths was at hand, a very, very busy time in Jerusalem. A time when many people would actually live in, in little temporary structures, reminding them of not only their, their, their times of wandering in the wilderness, but also since it was towards the harvest time, reminding them of God's provision for them as they journeyed as sojourners in the wilderness before God brought them into Canaan. So Jerusalem would be, as we would say, heaving with people. It would be very, very busy. And therefore, Jesus' brothers have a, a bit of a question in their minds. You know, why isn't Jesus going to Jerusalem? Why isn't he going to Judea? They're quite clear. They say, if you would do these things, then... Their disciples would, would see the works you're doing. No one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. They're clearly very keen that, that people would see what Jesus is doing. But what are their motives? It's not spelled out very clearly. It's only in the verses that follow that cause us to begin to wonder if their motives are really good motives. Do they simply want the, the message, whatever it is? Do they, they simply want the popularity? Do, do, do they want the glory? You know, no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. They, they are not sure why Jesus doesn't seem to be wanted to go up there and, and seize the opportunity. And that's something which those who don't really understand who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing struggle with. When Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber produced a musical which some of you will have heard of titled Jesus Christ superstar. One of the songs had very interesting lyric. The song is actually sung by the character who portrays Judas. He says, every time I look at you I don't understand 
why you let the things you did get so out of hand? You'd have managed better if you'd had it planned. Why do you choose such a backward time and such a strange land? If you'd come today, you would have reached a whole nation. Israel in 4 BC had no mass communication. Don't you get me wrong? Don't you get me wrong? Those words that Lloyd Webber and Rice penned for their musical are words that in some ways reflect the thinking of the brothers of Jesus. Why? Why aren't you going to Jerusalem? Why aren't you letting people see? Why aren't you getting the message out? It's interesting. This is one of the really few places in all of the Gospels where we really hear much about the rest of Jesus' family once he's grown. And as you've read and seen there in verse 3, it, it says, So his brother said to him, this is, this is his brothers, sons of Mary and sons of Joseph. We're sowing, saying to him, you know, why are you here in Galilee when surely where it's at is up in Jerusalem? Show yourself to the world. If you do these things. And then verse 5 tells us something at the same time significant and sad for not even his brothers believed in him not even his brothers you know i think there's a fair chance that it wasn't just jesus and his mother who represented the family at that wedding in Cana in Galilee. Every likelihood that his brothers were there first. They saw the first mighty sign. And of course, as we've read already in the opening verses of chapter 7, they've seen the signs, They, but they're expecting Jesus to, to make more of it and do more with it and, you know, and raise his profile. But not even his brothers believed in him. You know, that says to me, friends, that you can see all the signs and wonders in the world. Yet without true saving faith brought about by the work of the Holy Spirit, people will not believe. They did not believe in him. Notice what Jesus replies. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. My time has not yet come. It was a very significant consideration and in Jesus' purpose. Where for them, it, Jesus says, your time's always here. They didn't believe in him. They were simply, as it were, working out their own life plan. They would do this, they would do that. With clearly very little recourse to the plan and purposes of God. Well, not that God is not sovereign in their lives, but they would care little for that. They're really just more interested in, in Jesus gaining popularity. Yet Jesus was not out to gain popularity. Jesus was there to fulfill the Father's purpose and to do so in his time. 
my time has not yet come. That's reflected in the very first verse of our reading this morning. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. On the one hand, he knew that this was not the time for him to die. And of course, there's that other occasion when the people wanted to come and make Jesus king by force. And again, he, he disappeared from them because his time had not yet come. Jesus was working to a perfect plan. The Father's purposes being unfolded day by day. His brothers? Oh, said Jesus, your time's always here. Because they were not working to that plan. They just seemed to be following their own plans and purposes. As pretty much everyone else does who who doesn't seek to follow after Christ. But perhaps there's a question there we should ask ourselves. Are we seeking to live our lives according to God's time schedule? Well, we can make all our plans. We can do this. We can do that. We say, we'll be doing this. We'll be there. Oh no, the word of God says, no, you should say if the Lord wills. If the Lord wills. Can I make another application at this point too? A particular application for those who have perhaps been waiting, waiting for God to, to fulfill his purpose for us in some particular area. He'll do it in his time. God's timing is always perfect. Dear ones, there may be an issue that you are waiting for, you are longing for. Do not make the mistake of trying to take these things into your own hands and, and as it were, force God's hand. In his time, he will bring about his perfect purpose for you. Jesus continues, he says, the world cannot hate you but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. Just as John the Baptist himself had proclaimed the people's need to repent and brought himself upon, upon himself the wrath of many. Likewise, Jesus calling the people to repentance as he testifies about the, the, the world, that its works are evil, is knowing the hatred of these religious leaders because it is the religious leaders that he has singled out. They were the blind, as Jesus said, leading the blind. They were the ones who should know, who should have known better. And Jesus singles them out and therefore receives their hate. So yes, says Jesus, you go up to the feast. I'm not going. I'm not going with you. I'm not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. Now, in the fullness of time, when we come further into this chapter, we'll discover that after they had gone, Jesus makes his own way to the feast. But he was not going with them. His time had not yet fully come. Dare I say it again, friends? God works things in his time. God will answer our prayers in his time. God will chart out the course he has for us in his time. But before we begin to wrap things up in this message today, I want to come back to this issue 
of Jesus' brothers. Yes, not even his brothers believed in him. In Mark chapter 3, it gets even worse. We read there in verse 21, when his family heard of what Jesus was doing, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. Out of his mind. That was what his brothers were thinking. They did not believe in him. And of course, there in Nazareth, the town where Jesus had grown up, we read these words, Matthew 13, and when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there and coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offence at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour, except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Notice it didn't say he could not do many mighty works there. It says he did not do many mighty works there. In the presence of their unbelief, Jesus was not simply going to do more mighty signs as if it were that more mighty signs might have convinced them. No. So as we begin to really wrap this up, they were wanting Jesus to put his powers on display for whatever their motives were. Yet no set not so for Jesus. Jesus indeed was fulfilling the Father's plan and purpose, step by step with him. Even to that very point, when Jesus says his time has not yet fully come, when that time had fully come, then he went to Jerusalem. Then he went to the cross. There he died for our sins. And as the scriptures remind us, that was at just the right time Christ died for us. At just the right time, you say? Yes, because God's timing is always perfect. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us. Even though we did not know him. We only love him. We only love God. Because he loved us and gave his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus gave himself for us. At just the right time, Christ died for us. Yet, friends, there is also just the right time for us to put our trust in him. For the Bible says, yes, today, today is the day of salvation. It is always the right time to put our trust and our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And many of you listening to me, I know have. But perhaps you haven't. Today is the acceptable time. Today, now, is the day of salvation. 
you would but put your trust in him and then discover that everything that God has already brought into your life was there for a purpose to draw you to him in his time by his way perhaps it's not for yourself perhaps as loved ones you're asking for praying Lord would you in your time bring them to yourself many of us are in that position with loved ones who do not yet know the Lord as Savior and we pray for their salvation and their conversion dear ones do not lose hope Because those self-same men, James, Joseph, Simon, Judas, those self-same men who wanted to go out and pull Jesus into the house because they reckoned he had lost his mind. Those of whom Jesus would say, a prophet is not without honour except in his hometown, his own household. What became of them? Here's what became of them, friends. For after Jesus had gone to the cross, after Jesus had been buried and raised from the dead, after Jesus had been, a, the, a, after he had ascended into glory, we find a group of believers gathered together. They're waiting in Jerusalem. They're waiting for what Jesus had promised. And we read in Acts chapter 1 that all those with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Son, oh, bless your heart. Jesus was in glory before we read of his brothers coming to believe in him. And dear ones, some of us may be in glory before our loved ones come to know him, but let us never lose hope. Let us pray for their salvation. And as we do so, let us never forget that it will always be in God's time. Not a minute before it, not a minute after it, in his time, in his time, he makes all things beautiful in his time. Let us commit to him that which is on our hearts and trust him to indeed fulfill his purpose in his time. We're going to bring our worship this morning to a close as we sing together name of all majesty but first let us pray our gracious father and our god we thank you and we bless you that indeed you are always on time the lord jesus did not go to jerusalem that day with his brothers because his time had not yet come he did not allow the people to make him king by force for his time had not yet come. And Father, he didn't even allow the religious leaders in Judea at that time to put him to death because his time had not yet come. Yes, all things in your time. So Father, grant to us the faith we need to commit our times into your hands and our loved ones likewise. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now, name of all majesty.